We're glad to be together with you. And we do have a raft of people online that I can see here. So as we start, just uh, let me let me read the uh, let me do this. Let me uh, it's be tricky to go back and forth between my notes in here. Let me read this quote here. And as I mentioned last week, uh, Jay Jay Packer uh, just passed away um, a week ago, Friday, I believe, Friday or Saturday. And another thing that he said that was I thought uh, informative for a man of his stature and theologian of his stature. Um, as I look back on the life that I have lived, I would like to be remembered as a voice. A voice that focused on the authority of the Bible, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the wonder of his substitutionary sacrifice and atonement for our sins. And I think that's what we do today. We engage in the wonder of his substitutionary sacrifice and atonement for sins. Um, let's go to the next slide. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name will exult in you. And that's our desire that we be able to exult in our Lord Jesus Christ. I uh, have had a discussion lately with um, looking at what different churches and George Vanderdoos and I were discussing a little bit of the difference between you know how they do worship and how we do worship and how other churches do worship and we we do a little more participatory worship than they do. We do a lot of um, uh, antiphonal phrasing and, and, and uh, responsive readings and we do the covenant renewal, and we all participate in verbalizing the confession of sin. And uh, Zion does very little of that engagement. It's a different kind of thing, and, and there's other churches that do other kinds of things than we do. Um, my son-in-law and Jennifer's church does it a little bit different. They're kind of a Reformed Baptist church. And yet, in the end, the form of our worship is not the issue, is it? of how somebody else does it compared to us. And I, I wanted to read just a, a little bit from one of my favorite authors. He says, the issue is whether ec the excellency of Christ is seen. Worship will happen when the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, shines in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what has to happen. We must see and feel the incomparable excellency of the Son of God, incomparable, incomparable, because in him we meet glory and yet lowest humility. We meet infinite majesty and yet transcendent meekness. We meet in Christ's deepest reverence towards God and equality with God. We meet infinite worthiness of good and yet greatest patience to suffer evil. We meet supreme dominion and yet exceeding obedience, divine sufficiency and childlike trust. He says the irony of our human condition is that God has put us within sight of the Himalayas of his glory in Jesus Christ, but we have chosen to pull down the shades of our chalet and show slides of Buck Meadows, even in church. And then he steals from C.S. Lewis, we are content to go on making mud pies in the slums because we cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. I substituted Buck Meadows in there. Let's stand together as we recite covenant promises. Thus says the Lord, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. 
the Lord, save your people. I will gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. I will lead them back, for I am a father to Israel. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God for I am happy. The young women shall rejoice in the dance, and the young men shall be, and the young men and the old shall be merry. My people shall be satisfied with goodness. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. There is hope for your future. Your children shall come back to their own country. Restore us to yourself, O oh Lord, that we may be restored. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he my darling child? Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. My soul longs for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their people. They shall be my people. Return to your left, O my soul. Let us go into the presence of the Lord and worship him together. It is your duty to rejoice in God, rejoice then in the giver and his goodness. Be happy in him, O my heart. And in nothing but God, rejoice in the fountain that is always full. Galatians 6. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill 
the law of Christ. I think that's really interesting that it's such a simple statement, and I don't think it's a full breadth of it, but it's interesting that Paul says, bear one another burdens on another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Not all the law, but the law of God, and law of Christ is to love God and to love our neighbor. For if, every, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one with me, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The Apostle John wrote to us so that we would know that there is some understanding. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So let us in freedom confess together the wrong we have done. How can we stand before you with many, many sins? I have often loved sin and forsaken your mercies. I have scorned your providence and broken your covenant. Help me look on the one slain for me. Tell me again your sins, your many sins have been laid on my son. You are forgiven. Let's pause for a moment just to take a time to silently confess any sins that may not have been resolved between us and our Lord or our neighbor. Father, we thank you that you are a merciful God and that you understand our weakness and our frame. We pray that as your word does its work in our life, even this day, as it cuts between bone and marrow, as it reveals us to ourselves, we are dependent on your Holy Spirit for this work of confession, of recognition of our shortcomings and failures and disappointments as we have not been pleasing. So Father, we pray that you would take these things, that you would show them and yet that you would take them in your hands as you promised to do and remove them from us, remove them as far as the east is from the west. We thank you for your grace. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Rejoice with me and listen to the words of comfort from your God. He will show you mercy and have compassion on you. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has destroyed the one who had the power of death. Christ has released us from the fear of death. And Christ has freed us from our bondage. You who trust alone in Christ know that your sins are forgiven, that you are dearly loved by the Father, and be at peace with your God. Thanks be to God. Let's stand together. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, for the Lord is the great God, the great God above all gods.
few of you have heard that uh, David is preaching at RPC today. Um, George, uh, a couple days ago, had something happen. wasn't sure if it was vertigo, and it looks like maybe it's going to turn out to be a mini stroke. And so he called and asked for help. And we said, of course, one of us would help. And uh, as if David hasn't had a busy in the summer, David volunteered to uh, be there. And we're glad that he is there. Um, but uh, so we want to affirm that. And uh, also want to affirm those who, um, with the current state of this um, virus, and I guess I'm not calling it a pandemic anymore, it's officially a health emergency, according to the CDC. Um, but if, with what we're going on, there are brothers and sisters in our church that have chosen not to be with us. And so we go for them and make them feel uh, not a part of us. And so we're working hard to do that. But I see probably 15 families or names that are online with us. And so we sure welcome everybody who is able to participate today in various factions. And I think we as a church have been good at being gracious. I know there are disagreements at times about all these things that are going on, but uh, we want to be gracious as a church to reach out uh, as one church that is um, praying and hoping the best for one another. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray that you might do a work in us even today, whether we're online or whether we are here worshiping together. We pray that you might find our hearts to you, that you incline us to your testimonies, that you would make our times here or at home ones that we can turn our hearts to you, ones that we can rel revel in your glorious grace and mercy and your beauty. Help us to see that beauty, to exult in you on this day as we come together corporately to do that. We pray that we might not find a satisfaction in other things, in lesser things, in mud pies, but God, that we might aspire to the Himalayas of your glory, that we might look to you for the privilege and the opportunity to, to love you, to worship you, and to exult in you. Father, you have given us grace, and as we come to you and bring our request to you, you have promised to hear those things. And you have said that when two or three are gathered in your name, you will be in the midst of them. Just to affirm your promise to always be in our midst. You are not far beyond the stars, but you are omnipresent and you are with us and close to us. Father, we come and we bring prayer requests for the people of this church, for friends, for struggling people struggling their to understand your sovereignty and your might and what you're doing. Father, we pray for young men and women in courtship, marriage planning. We pray for those who can't be here because they are ill. We pray for expectant mothers that are looking forward to a delivery of a new child and yet maybe unsure of what is involved, particularly with COVID. We pray for TNRC as they are changing somewhat of their role and being more of a challenging thing for the staff there. We pray that you would be with them, guide them, and give them grace and minister to them. We pray for Bill and Rebecca as they try to do that remotely now, not being able to go into the rest home. We pray that you would be gracious to them in this time and help them to minister. We pray for business people in this uh, church and their businesses and the challenges that this uh, pandemic presents. We pray for George Vanderdusen 
and the challenges that um, maybe are going on in his life. We pray that you would bring healing and that he would be restored to full health. We pray that you would be with that church today and David Gregg Greg, as he preaches. We pray for children in, in school as we're looking towards soon starting up again for some that have taken time off. We pray that you would provide motivation and, and uh, endurance and anticipation of a good year. We pray for those who are looking for what their opportunities in college and vocational training are, have the, how they have been challenged and they look for what you have for them. We pray for parents maybe that are struggling in relationships with uh, their children right now just because of all that's involved in the complications there. We just pray that you would be with those parents that are looking to you to help them in that process. We pray for those who are struggling financially right now as it has changed so many situations and we don't know when that's going to end. Vacations canceled and maybe anticipated events that have been modified. We just pray now that you, we would see that you're still at work and you're still providing for our needs. We pray that we would be looking forward to what you're doing, maybe the opportunities even that you're giving that we would have never had if we had not been through this. So Father, help us to see what you're doing and understand your sovereignty in all these things. We pray for the ministry that goes on from this church that we pray for every week. Or we pray for the ongoing ministry of Todd and Colleen Adams, for David Gregg and Christian Brigade, for this do the principal study for classes with uh, that Mike is doing and the incredible outreach opportunities that may be there. We just pray that you would bless those. We pray for ongoing ministry at TNRC and for uh, Windsor, uh, for sidewalk walk counseling ministry, for the ministry in Myanmar, Orphanage and Training Center for all these and our sister churches, God, we just pray that you would work in mighty ways and bring blessing and goodness as we see you exalted in these things. We pray for our, our church leaders and our PC, for elders and deacons that lead and make tough decisions and minister. We pray for our nation. For the leaders there, we pray for those who are making decisions, governors, local health officials that are making tough choices and trying to analyze these things. We pray that there would be candidness and that their eyes would see clearly. We pray that churches would be opened up again, that schools would be opened up again, that right decisions that we feel like should be made would be understood and made and that there would be no hypocrisy in our leadership. We thank you for those churches who have decided to take a stand there, and there are quite a few of them that have chosen to disregard some of these orders. Lord, whether we are making right understanding of your scripture or not, we are striving to see truthfully how to respond. And so, Father, we just pray that you would give those who have decided to open and function, that you would give them boldness, and those that have decided their timing is not right, that you would give them wisdom as well to make some determinations and confidently move forward with the opportunities that they have. We pray now that you would minister to us through the preaching of your word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. I want to encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 21 to 22 this morning. A short two paths, or a short two verses, but much we can take from this and the other gospel accounts. Let's stand as we read God's word. Mark chapter 14, starting with verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Let's pray. Father, as you are our God, you are the author of Scripture. 
And as we try to understand who this man was, Simon, his role in the gospel account and ultimately the application of the pray for wisdom today. Pray for our willingness, our receptivity to hear truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Simon of Cyrene represents the last person that we'll be looking at in this roughly month-long survey of final encounters with Jesus. We've looked at Jesus' interactions with the rich young ruler, with Zacchaeus, with Martha and Thomas, with Pilate, and now with Simon. And here in Mark, we're told that Simon was from the country of Cyrene, which is modern-day Libya. If you know where Libya is on the map, you'll know that it's a country in North Africa. It's just west of Egypt on the coast of the Mediterranean. It was originally established as a Greek colony in the 7th century BC and later became a Roman province. Socrates was born in Cyrene. By Jesus' time, there was a sizable Jewish population and the most faithful Jews would attempt to make this trip to Jerusalem, this pilgrimage. And I want you to understand what such a, a journey takes. To travel to Jerusalem for the Passover was the desire of every Jew who lived outside of Judea, but Cyrene was nearly 900 miles away. And so those who made the journey typically made it only a handful of times in their life. If you walked eight hours a day, you would take a little more than a month to travel that distance, and that would be through unpredictable weather conditions. It would be through desert raiders and wild animals and other difficult circumstances. Even if you went part of that journey by ship, traveling from Cyrene's port, let's say to Joppa on the eastern Mediterranean coast, that trip would have been expensive. Not everybody could afford that, and then you would still require a 30-mile walk from Joppa to Jerusalem. The bigger point is that Simon made the pilgrimage to participate in Passover. And he was undoubtedly awed by the sense of history and, and kinship felt with all the other pilgrims that were here in town. So many people from other parts of Israel and other countries had gathered so that for this one week here in Jerusalem, that the population had swelled to many times its normal size. And the joyful and festive atmosphere that would have been true of this afternoon, like any other during that week in anticipation, would have been broken by the approach of an angry, chaotic mob. Some shouting, others weeping. And the reason for that crowd was the man near the front, struggling under the weight of carrying a large wooden beam upon his back and shoulder. Bruised and bleeding and stumbling, Jesus came near where Simon stood, and then he collapsed in weakness. Matthew's account tells us that Jesus was let out, which likely means let out from the city and not let out from the praetorium. He would have been led by a Roman centurion and several guards to Jerusalem and then outside the city walls, forced to carry his own cross as he was led to Golgotha. And Golgotha is the Greek word that is used to translate the Hebrew Golgolet, that means skull. From a few other passages, Hebrews 13, 12, John 19, 20, we know that Golgotha was just outside the city and near the north gate. It was, it was likely the usual place for executing criminals and called the skull due to its desolate look and its rounded skull-like plateau. And I can imagine Simon standing somewhere along this route, straining to see what was going on and then being startled as a Roman soldier grabbed him and ordered him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon must have been mortified. He knew that to carry this man's cross would make him unclean and thus unfit to eat the Passover meal. All those miles he had traveled would have been in him. Surely he was angry. 
perhaps, or fearful to disobey. But having no choice, he, he had any pride in this matter. He swallowed it. He took up the cross, and he followed Jesus. And as Simon carried the cross through the narrow streets, did he think about what could have possibly caused this man to suffer this condemnation? The hatred and sorrow that came from the crowd was intense, but Jesus focused on the road ahead of him, and he took one agonizing step after another. At times, Mark tells us he was even carried. And yet, not once did Jesus speak a word of protest. Simon had come to celebrate the Passover, but God had other plans, for he led Simon to a different sanctuary than the temple. He led Simon to Golgotha, where the true Passover lamb was to be slain. And Mark, in describing the situation in verse 21, says that Simon was compelled to carry the cross. That's a strong word used only twice in the New Testament, once here and once in Matthew 5, where Jesus is talking about Roman soldiers who might stop a Jewish citizen and force him to carry their things for a while. In classical Greek, this word meant one who was forced to fight in the army. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But first, I want to note that Simon is not mentioned again in the scriptures, but he is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And very interesting to me is the fact that Mark describes him as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now think about that for a moment. It's one thing to say... As you're describing Jesus moving to the cross, if you want to focus only on that, you might say something about the factual detail of a man from the crowd being forced to carry Jesus' cross. But Mark not only names the man, but also adds the fact that Simon was the father of Alexander or Rufus, and that would have only been useful information if Mark's readers actually knew who Alexander and Rufus were. And a Rufus is actually mentioned later in Scripture. Paul, for example, in his letter to the Romans, asks the people to greet beloved Rufus for him personally. Church history tells us that this, in fact, is the same Rufus in Romans as in the Gospel accounts, a devoted Christian who later became a bishop in Spain. It also tells us that his brother Alexander died as a Christian martyr. So why does Mark specifically note that Simon the Cyrene was the father of these men? Could it be to let us know that as a result of this encounter with Christ and bearing Jesus' cross, that Simon was a follower of Jesus, became a follower as did his sons. And in carrying that heavy burden, something changed Simon. And I want to encourage you this morning with this story, because here's a man who had an agenda, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and undoubtedly a whole host of expectations that did not include following after Jesus. But in the midst of that path, God came and compels, again that word, compels Simon to take a different path, one that he undoubtedly probably shrunk from at first, but ultimately one that led to the eternal benefit of his family and many others. The way to eternal benefit, though, went through the ugliness of the cross. Deuteronomy 21, 22 says that if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on that tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. And the Gospels and Acts, whenever they describe the crucifixion, do not use the phrase nailed to a cross. Instead, they say that Jesus was hanged on a tree. Why? Do you hear that in the Deuteronomy passage, there is a person that is hanged on a tree that is said to be cursed. 
And Paul makes the point in Galatians 3.13 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And then he goes on to quote Deuteronomy 21. So, as transgressors of God's law, as criminals, so to speak, we were slated to be cursed of God and exiled from him forever. We were to be the ones hanging on the tree, but Jesus took our place. He could have died in many other ways, but being taken out of the city and treated as a criminal was a perfect illustration of how we should have been treated under the wrath of God. And when Jesus tasted of the bitter fruit of that tree and drank from the cup of God's wrath, he became a curse in our place. He bore the penalty of God against sin and the threat of eternal death and exile from God. So by looking in faith to Jesus, God heals us through him. How many of you have heard the phrase, we must bear our own cross and we must walk as he walked? The phrases, they're biblical phrases. But there are also examples of the time of commonly spoken statement that if you really stop for a moment and ask what it means, you find it actually to be an uncomfortable statement. Bear our own cross, like Jesus, who having endured torture and ridicule and pain, could no longer carry that heavy physical burden by himself. Like Jesus, who was then nailed to that cross hung upon that tree. Walk as Jesus walked, with no place to lay his head, with the cross ever before him. And not just walk, but be forced to walk, as if doing so is co so connected to being a Christian that you cannot be a follower of Jesus without expecting to bear your own cross. Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And if that isn't hard enough, I'll quickly add what Jesus says in 14, 27 of Luke. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So in our flesh, we desire an easy faith, one that can be simply expressed as a time that we said a prayer, that we walked an aisle, or that we gave our lives to Christ and were baptized. And modern evangelism tends to summarize the gospel as God has a wonderful plan for your life and a way to be happy as you go about your normal activities. We don't like to have to tell people that they might suffer persecution for righteousness sake or that they might have to endure painful thorns in the flesh so as to help root out pride and refine their character but the truth is this when you are saved you are united to christ and in our year of studying the synoptic gospels one thing that we have all learned by now is that jesus's earthly life was a perpetual cross bearing so is it surprising that if we are united to Christ, that we will face the prospect inevitably that our own earthly lives include crosses to bear? So what does it mean to say that we must bear our own cross? We know from the last week our Lord was unjustly tried before Pilate, accused by the Sanhedrin, we didn't talk about it, but during that trial, Jesus was hit and spat upon and mocked and ridiculed, tortured, finally sent out to bear a heavy cross beam upon his bloody back. We know that the Son of God willingly became an outcast so that we sinners who have been justly ourselves cast out of God's presence might be invited back. Jesus was made a curse for us so that we might become holy, and that's why Hebrews 13, 12 
says that Jesus, in order that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate, right? He became a curse for us. So to bear our own cross means to endure affliction and trial, often unjustly put upon us by other people, but sovereignly placed upon us by the Lord, ultimately for our benefit and the benefit of others. Simon, no doubt, was ashamed, embarrassed, angry, maybe, that he had been diverted from his intended path, wherever that path was going to lead. And as the edges of this other man's cross dug into his shoulders, and as he plodded after Jesus through the remaining streets of Jerusalem and out of the gate, what was he thinking? Being a Jew, Simon knew that the cross was a shameful curse. Those who saw him might never forget that he had taken up the cross of the condemned Nazarene. And so we ask, what does this do? What does this have to do with us? How does this apply to our situation? Well, by nature, we are all a bit like Simon. We don't like the God-appointed afflictions that interrupt our schedules and our plans or the pain of cross-bearing, and we don't like how others react to it either. We want to be smooth and sanitized Christians, not cross-bearers. And to take up Jesus' shame and his cross and to follow him exposes us to the world. It includes us in the condemnation as the crowds were hurling insults upon Jesus. No doubt Simon felt that as he walked closely behind him and was carrying that cross, that he was somehow included in this group. Felt the reviling coming upon them. And that is what it's like to follow after Jesus, even as the people, even as the world casts its insults upon our Savior, we get incorporated in and included in. For as Jesus said, as the world hates me, so it will reject you, it will hate you as well. The cross-bearing is God's eternal means to not merely save you, but to conform you to be more like His Son. And the only way we begin to resemble the Lord Jesus Christ is when our flesh dies. And so Jesus, the Lord, uses crosses, the afflictions and trials we face to deliver us from fleshly desires. And his goal is, is not to make you comfortable in this world. It's not to give you an easy journey to the heavenly Jerusalem. That would not be the best thing for you. It is to make you holy. And time and again in the scriptures, we're told that the Christian life is one of affliction, Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, Romans 8, 17. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. Philippians 1, 29, to you it has been gifted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. First Peter 4.12, do not be surprised by the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for as though some strange thing were happening to you. Hear that common theme coming through? Don't be surprised. Cross-bearing is a part of the Christian life. It's not some strange thing that pops up in the midst of that wonderful plan and happy journey as we do whatever we want. It's normal. And the message of Scripture is that, and it's the testimony of the saints that have gone before us. God wants to teach us to look to Jesus alone. And that is why he takes away the distractions Everything upon which you would depend. 
Only then will we turn to him in desperation as our provision. We fit far too well with our God-ignoring culture. And like Simon, we often are on our own paths, but if God would let us go that way, even after saving us, if he allowed us to just forge our own paths, which is usually the path of least resistance and least amount of pain and most comfort, we would miss the way of sanctifying obedience. I know that I would become too content with the things of this world. And so bearing our cross means not only realizing this is a normal part of the Christian life, not only embracing the fact that this is God's sovereignly appointed afflictions that are for our good, that aren't just a result of living in a cursed world. We, we tend to have that attitude, don't we? Boy, our, you know, we live in a cursed world, so we must face afflictions as if... You know, that's kind of the cause effect, the natural thing happens is God stands aside and says, it's okay, as long as you call on me, I'll come alongside and walk with you and help you bear this burden, because after all, you live in a cursed world. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures actually say that God is giving you a cross for a reason. Yes, it may happen within the context of a cursed world. Yes, it may, in fact, arise because of the fact that we have all fallen in Adam and we are in love with our flesh and our desires. God wants to break us from them. That's the part of being in the cursed world. But friends, we need to say that we are willing Desirous, even joyful, to take up that cross. And when we have the strength to pick up those crosses, we look to Jesus and we follow obediently in his footsteps. Like Simon, we must follow after Jesus. Even if that way leads outside of the city, you know it will. Even if that way leads to the rejection of all people, you know it will. In John 15, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. 2 Corinthians 1 9 says, We have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead and delivered us from so great a death. And John Bunyan, you know him as the author of Pilgrim's Progress. He was also a pastor, wrote many sermons, preached many sermons. That's what ultimately landed him in jail. He wrote on this particular passage, 2 Corinthians 1 9, he said, I was made to see this, this, this sentence here. It says, We had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God. He says, I was made to see that if, if ever I would suffer rightly and bear my king's cross. So I want you to hear this because we've been talking about recognizing that God sovereignly puts these crosses upon us. And Bunyan makes a good observation. He says, if ever I were to bear it rightly, so how am I going to bear it well? I must first pass a sentence of death upon everything that can properly be called a thing of this life. Even to reckon myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyment, we hear what he's doing, he's going right to the inner circle of all the things that would be most likely for us to say, don't have the taints of the world. And really, that some of the things that are the most dear to us, myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyment, I must reckon them all as dead to me and myself as dead to them. I am the God 
because it is invisible, as Paul says in another place. The way not to faint is to stop looking at the things which are seen and start looking at the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are passing away, but the things that are not seen are eternal. You must pass a sentence of death upon everything that is of this world. Even the good things, like yourself, like your spouse, like your children, because those are all passing away, and the only thing that lasts are the things of God, which are eternal. And friends, understand what that's saying, because there are other similar passages like that. It's saying that we, we tend to focus on those things as the things that give us meaning give us identity, give us joy and happiness. And God reminds us that the only thing that brings eternal joy and satisfaction and eternal worth and identity is Him. And the irony of it all is that when we pass the sentence of death on those things that have to this point been so dear, so important to us, and we look instead upon the eternal God gives us the right way then to turn back and look at ourselves and our spouses and our children. Paul writes in Galatians 6.14, Far be it from me to glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world, everything, has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's what it means to bear your cross. And here's where everything fits together. Not, as, not only does God appoint your cross, not only does that cross bearing refine your character and work to your benefit and really change the way that you view not only the world, but you view all of your relationships, all of the things that you are called to do, whether it is your work or your family, but the very cross you bear drives you to the Word of God and to your knees where you find the strength to bear that cross. The reformer Martin Luther thought that we must suffer if we are truly to know the profound things of the Scriptures. Think about that for a moment. He's, he's saying there's kind of like this intro course to Christianity and then there's the advanced course. So the advanced course, where you really understand the deep things of God and His Word, can only be through this, this idea of suffering and bearing the cross of Christ. And, and Luther bases that thought on Psalm 119, 71, which says, It is good for me that I was afflicted so that I may learn your statutes. And so he wrote, as soon as God's word becomes known through you, the devil will afflict you. And that will make a real theologian out of you. It will teach you by those temptations to seek and to love God's word. You understand the connection that he's making? When we are facing the afflictions, when we are enduring through them, when we are we're uh, being assaulted by temptations. Where will you flee? You'll flee to God's word. You'll flee to his provision, to his spirit. And I love what Luther says. He says, I owe my papists to many thanks for so beating, pressing, and frightening me through the devil's raging that they have turned me into a fairly good theologian, driving me to a goal I would never have reached on my own. That's the attitude that we are to have. That's how the Bible can talk about bearing one's cross something that produces joy. If you are struggling under your own cross this morning, let me encourage you. God knows how difficult it is for your flesh. He knows how painful it is to bear your cross. But remember that he has measured out your path. He knows the way that you take, but he also knows that it is the way that you must take. It is the way that makes you grow deep in his word and deep in satisfaction. Draws you close to him 
and lets you know the fellowship of his sufferings. So my question to you this morning is, are you having difficulty bearing your cross joyfully? As long as you continue to chafe under that cross, God will press down a little harder until you learn to submit to him. Are you discouraged? If so, remember that Jesus faithfully bore the heaviest part of your cross so that you would not be crushed beneath it. You may think at times that you cannot bear your burdens, whatever they might be today, anymore, or that they will crush you, but they will not. Look back at your life and remember the times that God has delivered you. He will lift you up again, as Psalm 40, verse 2 says, even out of the miry clay. Jesus has already borne the heaviest part of the cross, for he was nailed to it and suffered the penalty for your sin. That is why you will not collapse. And the wonderful thing is that in our cross bearing, we do not serve a God that's unaware of our needs. He is a God who is moved with compassion in the midst of our weakness. The Jesus who went to the cross for you is now interceding for you at the right hand of the Father. And one of the things that he does as your merciful high priest and as your advocate is to give you the strength through the Spirit to follow him. And if you desire to grow spiritually, if you desire to be like Luther described, that good theologian, if you desire patience and maturity and all of those things, it's not going to come from reading books. It's not going to come from age. It's not going to come from 30 years of service at your job. Not in and of themselves. It's going to come from God placing a cross upon your shoulder. It's there that you learn the most about yourself and your sin and the Savior who bore his cross. And I'll tell you, God and his word and his promises become real in the midst of your trials and your dependence. That's why we read Paul 11 that no chastening seems to be joyful in the present, but it's painful. But nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now I want to suggest something radical. Hopefully everything I've said so far will be support for what I'm going to say next. Just as Christ's work would have been ineffectual without the cross, so he will actually stagnate as a Christian without a cross to bear. So friends, I'm not only suggesting to you that you grow deeply and more mature in the Christian life with bearing a cross. I'm not only suggesting to you that those are the advanced things of Christianity and we need to see them as normal, because you might from that come to the perspective of, okay, I'm going to endure. All right. I know it could be today, could be tomorrow, God's going to put that cross on my back and I'm going to stand up a little straighter this time because I know there's a sovereign purpose in all of that. You could be thinking that. But what I'm suggesting to you is more radical than that. I'm asking you to pray for crosses to bear. Because without bearing crosses, I believe on the testimony of Scripture that we will stagnate as Christians. Because I think that is the way through which God disciples us, through which he trains us. And he wants to lead us to the point where we actually begin to glory in his cross. You remember what I read just a little bit earlier by Paul? Glory in his cross, counting it great joy that you may be a loyal servant of the king under the most discouraging of circumstances. God wants you to be like that early church Ignatius who counted his chains of suffering. Maybe now you can understand what this quote means. He says, I count these chains of suffering as pearls of joy.
May these Christ-centered truths this morning make you willing to bear your cross. Think, after all, of how you should have been hanging upon that tree outside the city. Think of how you were on your own path and blissfully ignorant of the destruction that was ahead of you, and God mercifully gave you a new heart and compelled you to follow him into eternal life. Hebrews 13, 13 says, Let us go forth to Jesus outside the camp. Let us bear his reproach. Outside that camp, that's Golgotha. And that's a bleak, death-like hill. The missionary David Brainerd once said, Behind a frowning providence, God hides a smiling face. Let go of what holds you back from a full and radical service. Whatever's keeping you kind of sheltering in and hiding in the city, be willing to go outside the camp ready to suffer for the Lord, to bear those crosses, knowing that you are becoming a disciple and that you are achieving, that God is achieving for you a better possession and a lasting one. And I'll end with, end with these two encouraging passages. David writes in Psalm 1611, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. I like the, the reminder that even as we bear the cross, we are bearing it towards a destination that is filled with joy. And then a final thought from 2 Corinthians 4.17. Our light affliction, that's good to remember, it is light compared to what it could be. And, and the Holy Spirit enables us to bear it you know, as a far less heavy burden. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment on the eternal scale of things and time, but for a moment, is working for us, there's a purpose in it, and eternal weight of glory. Don't you love the, the mix of those metaphors of weight, our light affliction, just, just a moment, is working for us an eternal weight Eternal of glory. Let's pray. Father, you are the holy God, the one who loves us, who gives us this paradoxical wisdom and teaching from your scriptures that reminds us that we are to actually pray for the opportunity to bear our own crosses after Christ. Not only because you are working through that an eternal weight of glory, not only because that is the way you disciple us, but Father, because it helps us to die to the flesh, it helps us to crucify the things that would be more important to us, it helps us to depend upon you, to love you more, and so to become more like Christ, but also, in the great irony of the gospel, you've said that even as we bear these afflictions, we perfect in ourselves the suffering of Christ, and that we become extensions of his life and testimony. We become living letters of the gospel, and how we bear up under our crosses, Lord, is a testimony to this world that reminds them of, cross, of Christ who bore his cross willingly, who died for us for our benefit. And so as we bear our crosses in ways that the world marvels at, it says you shouldn't have this kind of joy. You should be running from this as quickly as you can. Why would you suffer like this? We are able to point to our Savior. And thus we are able to point people to life. So, Lord, I thank you for all of this and for these opportunities. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, what a, what a marvelous 
But strange lesson it is as we talk about cross-bearing. And of course, we've talked primarily about us bearing our own crosses, and we, we should not forget this morning as we gather together, especially as we plan to go to the table together, the one who actually bore the heaviest burden. That was Jesus who was willing to die in our place. And I've already said it, so I don't need to say it again as we prepare to come to the table. But the summary is simply that we are united to Christ. We share in the fellowship of his sufferings. And so even as we eat and drink of the table and remember what he has done for us, I think it's not only a way of our saying thank you to our Savior for doing that, but it's also a commitment from us as we eat and as we drink to say, Lord, we are willing to take up the cross and follow you. In fact, God has enabled us to do that. So another thing that we can be thankful for is, Lord, thank you for dying for me in order that you might save me, in order that you might transform my heart and my affections in my desires so that I need to take up your cross. Thank you for sustaining me. Help me in the week ahead to be joyful, to look for these opportunities that you sovereignly bring me, and not just endure, but to be grateful for what you will do through all of this. We pray as we begin, as we prepare to take from the table, I want to remind you that as you send a representative of your household, we are trying to space you out a little bit more. And uh, keep that in mind as you come up. We will serve you uh, enough wine or enough for your family and also give you bread at the same time. Please let us know how much you'd like of both. And we do have plenty of cups for you to take some extra for your family. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we participate in this meal together, how thankful we are that you have died for us and that you call us to live in union with you. That you provide us with the strength and you nourish us in that grace to now, in the days ahead, bear our own crosses. Lord, as we eat of the bread and as we drink of the cup, Lord, may we have that commitment upon our minds and our hearts. We will take up our cross and follow you. And we will do so along with our brothers and sisters here in this body. Because you did it first. Thank you, Lord, for bearing the cross for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
four. Three, actually. Yeah. Extra cups. Do you want extra cups? Jesus took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. He also took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand as we sing the glory of Hatri together. already walked the path before you, who is the captain of your salvation, who led the way, give you the grace and the strength and the joy to endure the sufferings before you. May the Lord bless you.